Hey everybody, CVH here, and in today's video we're going to be doing something I did for a video a few weeks back, and the reception was pretty positive, and that is taking a game from a recent stream, and sort of narrating over it and talking about some of the decision points, sort of a post-mortem, as someone described it in the comments. Uh, this was well received, so I decided to bring it back. I was playing some Merrick Battle Mage on stream earlier today for some laddering. I have neglected the ladder a little bit since hitting Legend this season, as I mentioned recently, and even though I was playing some Merrick for a Recent video. I know a lot of you like the deck and want to see some more of it on the channel, so I thought this game would be good to feature. Uh, so let's just jump right into it and discuss some of the more interesting turns as they happen. Uh, as you can see, we are taking this from the stream, so I put this image behind myself so I could block my previous image so it would look more natural, but you might see my arm every now and then. As you can see, we're also up against Nada Smurf, who is in top 10 of Legends, so a lot on the line, I guess you could say, for the latter, and uh, he was on Archer. And this is another good reason to feature this particular game, because the last Merrick Battle Mage video on the channel, uh, with this very recent version, I'm pretty sure, I was playing against Control Monks. So Archer, traditionally a bit more aggressive as a class, so it's nice to have sort of that versatility on the channel. See a little bit of Merrick against uh, more aggressive strategy and against slower strategies. Starting off with a Shimmering Peddler, hand is looking pretty decent. Uh, oftentimes you'll see people who are playing Merrick Battle Mage keep Markarth Bannerman early against non-blue classes, so it won't get lightning bolted. Archer, obviously, if you can get that Markarth to stick, the only answer they would have is really Earthbone Spinner, and of course, in every matchup, if Markarth sticks for you, it's incredibly, incredibly powerful getting those Nord Firebrand tokens, so you can then use them with Supreme Atromancer and Merrick itself. And we draw right into Cunning Ally, which could be a pretty good turn 3 play here. <laughs> I have no idea what I was doing on stream. That's just the best. So the Cunning Alley unfortunately misses. And I decide here, after much deliberation and moving of the cursor, to not go face. With the, oh, I do decide to go face. All right, so again, in, uh, in retrospect, I was thinking maybe I don't go face here. As you can see, it's been a while since this game. So the reason to not go face there is because I know next turn I'll be playing Markarth Bannerman, and I know the turn after that I'll be attacking face with the Markarth Bannerman. Uh, of course, I will be probably playing the Markarth in the right so as not to get cliff racered. Uh, and, of course, if I attack my opponent for 4, then that would put my opponent at 26 life and not destroy a rune. However, I can't be totally sure. Maybe opponent's going to put up a guard or something, and I figure I'll probably wind up getting aggressive at one point anyway. It's also worth noting that almost every single archer deck on the ladder plays Triumphant Jarl, so I'm balancing the risk of Markarth hitting a Prophecy card in the first rune versus the risk of maybe my opponent getting a bit too aggressive. I didn't deal enough damage early. All of a sudden, Triumphant Jarl really hurts. So I do make the call. It was a tough call. I don't know uh, what is actually correct there, but I do hit for the two damage. And those little decisions can add up over time. My opponent makes the call to Shadow Lane a House Kinsman here. House Kinsman not normally seen too often, and in this turn, of course, uh, I know I'm going to be dedicating my entire turn to the Markarth, so I didn't break destroy the rune uh, with that three damage cunning ally attack. I wanted to make sure uh, I didn't need to respond to anything, I could just develop the Markarth. Unfortunately, he did have the one uh, important answer to the Markarth in the Earthbone Spinner, but fortunately, you know, it turned around. I do have another Markarth, and this one looks to be pretty, uh, pretty safe more or less. The biggest threats besides Earthbone Spinner are anything that deals a point of damage plus finish off or Leaf Lurker. So at this point I was just hoping my opponent wouldn't have that. Uh, when I see this game and I get a little disappointed because I'm, I'm thinking he probably is going to have the finish off, but he doesn't. Just playing the Goblin Skulk and trading with the Cunning Ally. So definitely going to get two Nord Firebrand tokens there. Uh, so let's see what I decide to go with this turn. Ideally, I would like to protect the Markarth, but I know in my heart that it's probably going to get Leaf Lurkered next turn. That would be one reason why he would play the Skaven, is to set up a Leaf Lurker. Even if I clear the rest of the board with actions from my hand or shackles with the Harpy, uh, it could still be susceptible to Leaf Lurker, which is not a card that he would have been able to play alongside Skaven last turn. But uh, my Markarth's going to still be damaged, even though I will make a, sort of an attempt to keep it alive. There's always that chance they don't have Leaf Lurker, and the benefit of getting another attack with the Markarth is pretty huge. So I decide to go ahead and ward, even though it gives the Leaf Lurker a bit more value. The upside to that would be 
uh, you know, tantamount to almost just winning the game on the spot. It's just insane. So you can have Shadow Shift, the Skaven Over, take a favorable trade on the non-worded Wordcrafter. I did want to develop something in the left there so I could start taking back the field lane, but I didn't put the Wordcrafter and the Harpy in the same lane so as to not make future Skaven Pyromancers worse. Uh, but here's where here's a turn that uh, Merrick Battlemage would like to be in a lot of the time, which is the Ice Storm leading into the Atromancer turn. So I'm just going to hit for two, because I know Atromancer is going to destroy a rune next turn when I play it, dealing the four damage regardless, and simply use Storm after that to clear the entire board, including my own guys, knowing that he can develop a bit on the clear board, which is not usually great, but Atromancer will be more threatening than whatever he'll be able to play. So in this turn, the big decision here isn't really what to do as far as which big creature do we spend our magicka on. The question is really where to send the Nords. Uh, just doing the math in my head during this little uh, downtime here, deciding whether or not I want to send the Nords to face or whether or not I want to use them to clear the House Kinsman, which is eventually, I believe, what I go with because otherwise the Kinsman would be able to clear my 5-3 uh, Flame Atronach on the left. Uh, but I don't. I do think I hit a Prophecy here. No, I don't hit a Prophecy. That's good. See, it's hard to remember these games after the fact, so it's nice to look at. Get my opponent down to 14, then he heals up to 17, and getting pretty lucky myself. That's the prophecy. <laughs> the House Kinsman triggers, uh, hits me down to 24, and I get to get a free Lightning Bolt on the Skulk. So last turn, my opponent had all of the initiative on the board, and this turn, I have all the initiative on the board, thanks to a little bit of a timely prophecy. Uh, fortunately, I would have been okay with the situation, even if I hadn't gotten lucky with the Lightning Bolt. The Goblin Skulk, not too threatening on turn 8 or 9 as it would be on turn one or two, and frequently is. So Skaven Pyromancer and the Sharpshooter Scout going to clear up my Atromancer. And a Merchant's Camel. Now this really threw me off because you normally see Merchant's Camel in the Swindler's Market Archer decks because it's a, it's a pretty good card for combo decks, allows you to cycle, but as far as a mid-range deck is concerned, which is most archer decks, it's pretty poorly statted. I don't think there's any way around that. It's just horrible stats for a 4-drop, doesn't really trade, doesn't really push too much damage. Uh, so I was informed by chat that there was apparently a version going around that was part mid-range, part combo. Uh, so, you know, I didn't really exactly know what to expect after seeing the camel. Pretty interesting stuff there. But I do decide to just push my aggression here, push my aggression with the Sentinel Battle Mace. And this is freaky too, because I go in for the 9 damage to set up lethal next turn, and uh, or hopeful lethal next turn. And two Brotherhood Slayers pop out. So all of a sudden, that's a lot more damage than I anticipated. The board beforehand was like, oh, well, there's no way he's ever going to kill me. And after the Brotherhood Slayers add six damage to the board, uh, not only can he clear up the board really well if he wants to, but he can also just start adding a lot of damage. And the camel actually is even scarier when you think about that, because if it's a camel... Uh, that means it could be sort of combo-oriented, something like a Swindler's Market deck, or maybe a lot of tokens or something like that. He's obviously searching for some big combo potential, and uh, 6 damage can add to the board and seriously be detrimental. That can just be the difference. 6 damage is a huge amount of damage, especially if he's searching for cards like we might even see this turn. But I do just bring out the Breton Conjurer. So what if he has another Earthbone Spinner? The fact of the matter is that the Breton plus the Wardcrafter, they're both warded. And uh, I, did, I did that just so Wardcrafter would be harder to deal with. Obviously the 5-2 he can clear it if he wants anyway. And the Breton and the Wardcrafter represent lethal by themselves if he can't interact with either of them, which is the big hope. He could have raw curses or whatever. He does play Northwind Outpost. And here I'm thinking, you can see my arms over my head. I'm like, oh, he's found the combo potential, adding even more damage Thanks to the Brotherhood Slayers with the Orc Clan Captain, all of a sudden, I'm dead to, uh, at this point, I'm dead to double raiding party, but after he makes that attack, he plays another Orc Clan Captain, so that's 10 damage on board, and if he played raiding party, it'd be another 8, so I need this prophecy, I do get a Shrieking Harpy, which allows me to neutralize this 5 damage. Odds are he had a raiding party in his hand, and that raiding party, each Nord would have done 4 damage thanks to the two Clan Captains and the Northwind Outpost, but with the Timely Prophecy, we were able to mitigate that. Uh, so that was, as I talked about on stream, that was kind of a game uh, where it felt like very hard fought on both sides for like the first 10 turns or so. Uh, you know, we were both making plays, really fighting for the board and everything. And then all of a sudden, I make this aggressive push. I have the initiative. He gets two prophecies. He gets all the initiative back. And then he finds this combo potential. And it looks, we don't have guarantee that he had the raiding party, but it looks like he just would have had lethal. He makes his own aggressive per push, and he gets stopped by our own prophecy. So kind of a prophecy battle back and forth. Obviously, everyone's favorite part of Elder Scrolls Legends games. But I thought it was a good game through and through, despite 
Uh, a little bit of both of us relying on prophecies as a crutch in those last couple critical turns. But hopefully you all enjoyed a look at uh, some of the plays of Merrick Battlemage and some interesting archer plays as well from a different kind of archer deck that maybe we'll see more of on the ladder. If, as always, if you've enjoyed, feel free to leave a like. Feel free to subscribe to the channel for more gameplay videos. Let me know if you like stuff like this. Let me know what kind of videos you like in general. This channel's here for you guys to enjoy, so do let me know. Feel free to follow my stream in the description so you can catch some of these games live, and I'll see you guys next time.